Hi, everyone. We appreciate your support of Pastor David Rosales and the ministry of Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. Because you are one of our faithful viewers, we wanted to let you know about a brand new program that will begin airing August 21st called Let's Talk Marriage. It will feature Pastor David and his wife Marie answering questions on the topic of marriage, family, raising kids, and much more. They will dive into contemporary issues, some of which are controversial, that will impact couples and their families. Most importantly, we will gain practical insight about how to effectively navigate the trials, problems, and challenges of a married life and raising a family in today's world. Be sure to tune in right here. Let's talk marriage. I hope you can join us. You know, so this just leads me to the topic I want to discuss with you both today. Uh, you know, it, a lot of things have been revealed. The church has been, re a lot of things have been revealed about the church during this time. And one of the things that, uh, that I've seen is that the entertained church uh, hasn't really been the church that people need during this time. Uh, so I, I chose the topic, the entertained church, the entertained family. You know, Spurgeon uh, quoted, a time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. You know, earlier, you and I were speaking and, and uh, you're sharing that Paul points out that, uh, that the church is to be provoking Israel to jealousy. Uh, and so what are your guys' thoughts or definition of what the entertained church is? I think that we've always had uh, an awareness that mm -hmm. that the gospel in and of itself may not have a theatrical appeal to people, that it's not it's not provoking them to an amusement. Mm -hmm. It's it's something that is very serious and when presented in the fashion that it deserves, which means in a serious and sober-minded way, not to mean you can't smile and laugh and enjoy yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, I do when I'm teaching and I have opportunity to uh, to say something to make us laugh together. I, I, I think that's fine. But when the church is built on the personality of that pastor and his, his pet doctrines or his mm -hmm. current concerns, it's not, it's not focusing on Jesus. And, and what happens is you begin to orchestrate things to capture audiences. And instead of training up disciples, you build up just a group of listeners. And as you build up a group of listeners, you begin to be afraid to offend the listener because that means you're going to lose your audience. With the audience, when they like what they're hearing, comes sometimes a giving heart. So they begin to support and finances start coming in. And before you know it, that pastor has become an entertainer. He's become somebody who is theatrical, somebody who is careful not to say things to offend sensitive listeners. And therefore he has to find ways to appeal to the carnal desires of the majority. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, you end up with a bunch of uh, goats and you start entertaining the goats. And that's what that's what Spurgeon would have been saying. That's what he was saying. And that's what we see today. I, I believe that there are numerous quote-unquote ministries that are not teaching the Word, that are simply not giving Bible studies. There have been times, and I've heard someone who has used the Scripture and then twisted it to mean something entirely different, that you begin to wonder if Jesus were seated in front of that man, if Jesus would be nodding his head in approval, saying, oh, that's exactly what I meant. Or when, if they were quoting from Paul, if Paul would have sat there saying, exactly, you got it right. There's so much twisted scripture. There's so much appealing to, to carnality. I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. I've, I've been a believer um, this year, at the end of the year, I celebrate 50 years of walking wow. with Christ, John. And um, I celebrate in September 47 years of opening up the book, opening up the Bible to teach people. That's a long time. And I've seen things over the years that have come into church, waves of doctrine, winds of doctrine that have upset and, and destroyed. I've seen plenty of those things. And it all goes back to not loving the word. It all goes back to being afraid of the people. I mean, God spoke to Jeremiah. He said, be not afraid of their faces. They're not going to approve of the things you say. They're not going to like it. They're going to be mad. They're going to do some things ultimately that 
will cause you to suffer. Don't be afraid of those people. But there are quite a number of pastors that I'm, a, I'm aware of who uh, seem to be very afraid of disapproval, very afraid. So they say things that appeal. They, they tickle the ear of the hearer, which falls right in line with Paul saying what's going to take place in the end times. And so we do have an entertainment-oriented uh, nation, and we have an entertainment-oriented church, no doubt. And the sad thing is, you know, I just was recently speaking to somebody who was going through a difficult time in their life, and and it brought a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, and then was sharing with me uh, some of the teachings that they've been listening to. And I started thinking about the, the, the exactly what you're saying. How much weight does that really hold when somebody's going to a church that's entertainment-oriented and they're going through a difficult time? Then what's, what's the purpose of the church if they can't even help them go through these difficult times? And it really revealed to me that, you know, with the COVID-19 and the cause and the panic and the fear, with now people going to these entertain-oriented churches, when they start going through a difficult time, where's their faith? I mean, the Proverbs tells us that if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that we have the greatest faith, but when we have the word taught to us week in and week out, we know that when we go through difficult times, we can rely on God's word. Mm -hmm. And I, I find that very interesting that uh, these entertainment-oriented churches you know, they, they're, they're tugging at the emotions of the feelings or they're, they're doing this and they're doing that and they're tickling the ears. And, and then when, when the rubber meets the road, what happens? And I'm seeing that. And, and how do you think that has affected our families? You know, even with our church, we, we get fed the word and we, we have a model of you and Marie as in, for marriages. And the word that is taught from our pulpit, from your pulpit comes down and it's, and it's saturating our families, and godly-like families are being produced because of the Word of God. How are families and marriages affected by these or entertainment, church-oriented styles? Oh, uh, if, if, if all you want to do is go to church to feel good about yourself, then, then it's feeding into the, um, the arrogance of... of human of, of human um what's the word i want to use um human human beings can be arrogant we, we, we think that what we do is right what everything we do is good etc so if all you ever hear is that you're just fine the way you are and you go to church to be making to make you feel better about yourself well naturally you're going to live for yourself in the family and if you're living for yourself in the family that means my wife needs to do everything that I want her to do to make me happy, or she's, she's going to think he has to make me happy, and then the children fall into play with that. Everything in their life, I have to do something to make them happy, and before you know it, none of us are holy, but all of us are trying to be happy. I, I really believe that when you don't have a well-rounded diet, when God's Word isn't taught to you both the blessings as well as the penalties for rejection, when you don't have balance, your whole life's out of balance. And so what we have right now, I think you already mentioned it a moment ago, John, is we have people who go through very difficult times who are wondering why they're going through these difficult times because all the preacher ever has told them is that you're not the tail, you're the head. You know, everything's mm -hmm. supposed to work out just fine for you. So there must be something wrong with your faith or the way that you're living because you're not putting into practice the things that I have taught you. And in fact, that charlatan of a, of a preacher is out there in his, his jet. He's living in his multi-million dollar mansion, taking vacations in places that others only dream of going, and he's doing it all in the name of Jesus. And so he's not feeding the flock, he's fleecing them. Mm. And unfortunately, the word of God not being taught, they're not getting discernment. And because they're not encouraged to read on their own and to grow on their own, many of them remain deceived and that's going to destroy everything. It destroys family. The beginning of the church, um, the life of the church is, is the home. And, it, and if in the home, the guys, the men aren't, aren't really leading and the, the women are not submitting to the leadership of a godly man because he's not godly, you're going to have conflict. And, and that's what we see taking place all the time. In churches like this, I'm not saying that only churches that don't teach like we do 
only they have problems. No, every church has problems because every church is made up of human beings with problems. But when you emphasize the right things and encourage and hold them to those things and, and live those things, you've got a better chance of seeing God move in your life. And when the tragedies and when the problems and, and when the pains um, enter into your life, you know who to hang on to. Mm -hmm. You know, these guys, a lot of times they're looking to the superstar preacher up there, the guy who spends more time in the weight room than he does waiting on the Lord, Amen. that guy. Yes. You know, he's got to have that tight T-shirt on. What's going to happen when that guy's my age? You know, he comes out there. He's going to wear a girdle. I mean, what's he going to do? <laughs> what's he going to do? <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, you know, in John chapter 14, Jesus promises that uh, that their spirit of truth who the world cannot receive is because they can't see him. And I think about in these in these situations when the spirit of the Lord can't be found, something's taken away their attention. You know, something has been uh, replaced by that, whether it's I'm basing everything on my feelings or I'm basing everything on what the what they're being offered and staying, instead of uh, banking on the promises of Jesus saying, I will not leave you as orphans, going through difficult times. What are your thoughts about, about that, Pastor, about not being able to see the spirit of truth in, in, these, in light of these uh, entertainment-based churches? You know, the Word of God, when rightly divided and applied, it creates a new lifestyle. I mean, people are supposed to live as if God has touched them, right? And so if they're not being taught how to live, even, even by just reading the Word of God and finding application, well, you end up living as you desire or as you please, but you're not really going to live for Him because you don't know what He wants. You know, when Marie and I went on our first date, I might have mentioned this before, but when Marie and I went on our very first date, you know, I picked her up at her, at her apartment at around 11 or so. It was about 11. Listen about that. About 11, and uh, we spent the entire day together, and then then we, um, I went and dropped her off, and I left her place at 1 in the morning, and all we did was talk. We talked for all those hours. So that was from our very first date, John. I mean, Marie and I, to this day, do the same thing. To this day, all these years of being together, I don't find anybody more interesting to be with. I don't find anybody more enjoyable to be with, anybody that that I would prefer being with. And so we have invested in each other in a way that I think God wanted us to do. Mm. I don't worship her. She doesn't worship me. But we love each other, and we love each other because of Jesus. And so together we have grown. I uh, The other day I, someone was asking, perhaps you... Um, I think it was you. I think it was in conversation with you and maybe a couple of the other guys. But Marie has never had another pastor in her life. Mm -mm. She's never, never had, had another pastor. pastor. I haven't. Yeah. I've been her only pastor all these years because she was in my Bible study. She came to faith in Christ through my sister in our Bible study. Mm -hmm. And she has never sat at the feet of another teacher, even when I was in my early 20s. I have always had that position in her life. Mm -hmm. and and I retain it. I have never yielded it up. She has never called pastor so-and-so pastor. You know, even when I was attending church, even when she and I were, when I was a, a Bible teacher alone, even when I was an assisting pastor, she's never called another man her pastor, ever. She has one pastor. Wow. And that's been me. She has Jesus, her great shepherd, but she has her pastor husband, pastor boyfriend, really, pastor husband. So we've never known anything That's different. True. What would you attribute to your steadfastness, Marie, and, and just being faithful in that area? When I came to his Bible study, I, I never left it. I mean, it was consistent, pretty much consistent. Maybe once I wasn't there, like Dave said last just week. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but consistency, you know, and he, 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 he encouraged me in the word, you know, he would give me a little assignments and, 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 uh, you know, and, and show me some of the, um, some of the scriptures that were, um, that would, uh, help me, uh, uh, grow in my walk with the Lord. And, um, and, uh, and it's been like that since then, 
basically it, it really has it's mm -hmm. been a it's my life changed completely it, it was and I, i'm so thankful um i'm th i'm so thankful that i met my husband and um it's been a blessing to serve the lord all these years and and uh i can't imagine going back to mm -hmm. where i i was before I, I can't imagine having a life like that because god has blessed us in abundance and I love him and I want to serve him and serve our church family the women I love the women I love what I've loved what he's he's given to us mm -hmm. uh, 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 precious people precious church a loving precious, church huh? and a precious pastor <laughs> and a precious man <laughs> <laughs> a wonderful man <laughs> Precious she calls sounds me kind her of, precious, but she sounds like Gollum when she says it. Precious. <laughs> my precious. precious sounds a little sweet, doesn't it? Too sweet, huh? <laughs> yeah. You know, Marie, one of the questions I'd, and uh, maybe some of the women are out there are wondering, you know, when you have your submission to Christ, as as Pastor just mentioned, as your as your as your shepherd, but you being able to look to Pastor as your pastor and then your husband. That role, have, was that ever a difficult place for you to see, okay, I see he's my husband and my pastor, or he's my pastor and then my husband. Was there uh, any like any type of struggle with that? Not really. I, I don't think I, I had that kind of struggle. I think from the very, I respected him. I, you know, I mean, it's not like we haven't had our times of disagreements and, and all that. She admits when she's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting. What are the I'm not wrong very often. <laughs> <laughs> One of the questions but... that somebody uh, submitted last week and I didn't have a chance to ask is, uh, <laughs> when you guys argue, do you guys speak scripture to one another? Yeah, you, know, like... mm, uh... you know, scripture isn't something that you quote. It's something that you live. Mm. That's, yeah, you that's... know, and so the way we treat each other is reflective of what the scripture teaches us. You know, we were talking the other day. I was just, we were just talking about this uh, yesterday, Marie and I. And this is true. People can believe it if they want or they don't. It doesn't matter to me. Ultimately, it's true. We don't fight. You know, the question about, you know, fighting. Yes, when we got together as husband and wife, yeah, you know, uh, you know, there were times where, where iron sharpens iron. There were times yes, that absolutely. she has her way of doing things. I have my way of doing things. And it took a while for her to realize my way is always the best. <laughs> <laughs> we, it, took, <laughs> it took us a while to learn how to adjust to mm -hmm. one another, to learn to respect one another, to yes. communicate, to, to, do, to do those things. And John, so, and it wasn't immediate, and it wasn't in a week or a month or a year. It was over time. And, and Marie and I we, we, I, we honestly don't. We don't argue. We don't fight anymore. Those, those battles were fought early on. Yes. And so what we do now is if, if I disagree, about something with her, it's it's never so huge that it has to be an issue. You know, I think people make mistakes when they want to fight about everything. You have to do this, do that, or this and that. I think that's a, a big mistake. So only the major things, the things that really matter are the things that, that we need to say we have to talk about this. And, and there's so few of those things between us now, I don't even think about it. Do you guys still study one another? That's what you do. That's what husbands are, mm. were commanded to do. The husband dwell with your wives according to knowledge. Yeah, why? Because one of the things about a human being is we change mm -hmm. over time. Marie's not the 22-year-old girl that I knew anymore, and I'm not the 24-year-old young man. That's right. We're older, and so we change with time. If you're not changing, you're dying. Mm -hmm. So we change. You know, we adjust to things. We, we grow. You know, if we're not growing... So no, so I'm I'm constantly watching my girl. Mm -hmm. I know I know most of I I can read her mind, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. I know her, but one of the beautiful things about being a human being is you can change, and something that mattered to you in one day may not matter to you the next. There's nothing wrong with that, and so I, I would say that together we've we've learned to uh, just adjust, and and. We've done a good job. I, I can't imagine anybody else that I could ever want to be with, even think of being with. 
that doesn't exist. This person, Marie, has been the person I poured my life into, mm. and she's done the same with me. So, no, we know each other, and we, don't, we, we, and we honestly don't fight. If I get upset at her for anything, it, I, don't, I, don't, I don't raise my voice or anything. I'll just say, no, um, that's not something, and we talk like that. Mm. Now, well, let's deal with this. Or she'll, she's got every right to tell me the same thing. And, and if she feels like it, she does. And, and we, don't, we just don't fight anymore. Thank God. <laughs> right. Seriously. It's sweet. We have a, it's, these are our, 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 our latter years, mm -hmm. you know, of course. You know, and it, they've been sweet. They get sweeter, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And again, a marriage based on God's word versus a marriage that could be based on entertainment purposes in terms of the church. The, the opportunity to continue to study one another here in the endearment, even now uh, between you two, because it was based on God's word. You know, when you, when you, as a, as a, as a man, when you, when you realize, you know, that, that, that a good wife is, is a gift. When you realize that, you know, I'm not one who's going to exchange a gift. And my, my kids will tell you that about me. Somebody will give me something, and they're the ones who try to force me to get rid of it. <laughs> I don't get rid of stuff, you know? They say, oh, Dad, you're a pack rat. And I don't believe that I am, but I do attach sentimental value to things. Yeah. And so when, when I have even simple things that were given to me by somebody, and you look at my desk, they'll, they'll come in and clean it off because my granddaughters just gave me all these pictures. I'll keep them on my desk. So Anna, my daughter, will come in and she's going to clean the desk off because she knows Daddy keeps these things. So if I keep little pictures or things like that, how about a human being? Mm -hmm. You know, so no, no. Um, I have the most valuable person in my life. I have no desire for anything else. Not at all. Not That's at all. That's amazing. It's beautiful to hear. I mean, again... We see so many, so much brokenness in our marriages today. We see men not stepping up and leading their wives. We see wives, even in their part, not stepping up and being what God has called them to be. And, and again, we, we see that throughout even the church. And it's sad to see that God has really given one another as a gift. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the beauty and the love that, I mean, if I were to ask you both, is there anything besides the Lord Jesus Christ? Is there anything other that you love the most besides your husband or your wife? Just our family. Our children. We yeah. love our babies. Babies. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But yeah. no, I'm. And I can't imagine I think... anything with you know what we have. Yeah. Listen, look at the look at this situation we have right now, John, where people are freaking out because of this virus and this and that. You know, the people are in home actually having to get to know the person they've been married to 15 <laughs> years. Think about that. Yeah. You know, th there's a real problem with that. It just shows me the neglect that has taken place in that home. You know, from very early, mm -hmm. very early, Marie and I had dates. We did. Even as married couples. The dates are not going out and getting dressed up and, you know, going some... No, our date is, let's get some coffee. Mm. That's, That's what our funny. dates are. From the beginning, you know. Let's make Friday a time when it's, we got time just for us. Even when we had small babies, mm -hmm. we would find time for us. You know, and, and it's hard. You got four babies. We had five pregnancies in six and a half years. Wow, wow. You know, we lost one of our babies, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so we had to find time. We had to find ways because we did not want to be um, like ships passing in the mm -hmm. night. I, I, I wasn't going to be that. Um, and so we chose, we chose each other, you know. Before there were kids, there was Marie. And when the kids get married and move out of the house, there's still Marie. That's and right. that's the way it works for us. And that's how it's worked. Pastor Marie, how would you encourage our church during this time as we wrap it up? And, you know, we've been talking about a few different things that the entertained church, the entertained family, the entertained marriages, uh, how would you encourage the women and our church in these times, Pastor and Marie? Go ahead, baby. You know, I would, for the women, I would say, get it. Make sure you're reading the Word, that you're studying the Word, and that you're nurturing your children. And 
these are the best times in your life mm. when you you have your kids little or you know um when you can pour into them you know they'll grow up soon so put your heart into your children love them nourish them give them the word love your your husband you know minister to your husband show them how a, a godly wife ought to act mm -hmm. you know treat them kindly um just you, you pour into them pour into their little minds this is when they can hear god's word and this is the time where they can remember it so this is it's it's a vital time to pour into them especially when they're little mm -hmm. because that will go with them as they grow older mm -hmm. and they'll remember those scriptures later on and, and so mm -hmm. um and uh, be a good wife to your husband um be that woman that serves her husband, loves her husband, encourages her husband. I think the men need a lot of encouragement, especially now that some of them have have been uh, let go, and uh, and and they can be feel, feeling pretty down. You know, where where what's happening here? That you know, their lives have been crushed right at this moment. Moment, and they need to be uh, uplifted. And their wives, you know, we have a lot of power. And that, and the fact that we can encourage our husbands, and we can love them, and um, and we can uplift them, and and uh, they need to know that they're they're so important to us, and uh, and and uh, just to be that wife, that loving wife to your husband and to your children. It's it's it will be fruitful in the end. And for such a time as this, I just think, you know, we have the opportunity to do just such that in a very real way during these times. Amen. You know, the, uh, the, the husband has authority. The woman has influence. And when the, when the husband washes the wife with the water of the word, she answers to God. Because she may have a difficult time with her husband, but she answers to God. The wife is to submit to her husband as she says, submits to the Lord. And so if the husband has the wisdom to live out the word and to give out the word, then that helps the wife to know where her proper uh, relationship with him, how that really works. And um, if he's cherishing her the way God commands us to, then she sees the value of the relationship. Years ago, my dad, many years ago now, my dad and I, Marie and my mom, went to, um, we were going out, which we didn't do very often. It was an afternoon. We went somewhere together. We were in Rancho Cucamonga. I do remember that. And um, my dad and I stopped at a store, and he was picking up some soda and things like that. We were going to have a meal. And so we stopped at a store, a small, small uh, mom and pop. And there in front of me was a man and his wife. And I'll never forget this because the, the guy put his, uh, he, he put his um, groceries on the counter and pulled out his wallet and put down his money and paid for it, put his wallet back in his pocket, turned around and kind of marched out. She picked up the bag carrying the groceries and she followed him dutifully out the door and down the street and I was with my dad and I was walking with my dad and I'm going to be real I'm a Mexican-American these were a Mexican couple about my dad's age and I looked at this Mexican guy walking in front of his wife like that with that machismo that that a lot of Mexican guys have and I turned to my dad and I said, Dad, I want to thank you. And he looks at me. He said, for what? I said, for never treating my mother the way that man is treating that woman. I want to thank you. I really believe that a husband is to cherish the wife, to nurture her, to nourish her, to protect her, to encourage her, to be her leader. You know, the, the, the Bible says to us that, in 1 Corinthians 11, 
that the woman is the glory of the man. And my father once told me, son, he said, Dude, does not that man who was not treating his wife properly realize how bad he looks because of his marriage? And that was one of those insights my father gave to me because my mom was a little firecracker, John. My mom had an opinion about everything. <laughs> and if she wanted yours, she'd give it to you. That was my mom. My dad was a quiet man. But when my dad entered into the room, when my dad was there, my mom was respectful to that man. Why? Because he loved her. He laid down his life for her. And she knew that there'd never be a man in her life who would love her like my dad did. Mm -hmm. There would never. My dad was her husband from the time she was 17 years wow. old. Wow. And he was 20 He's years precious. old. And he loved her to the point that when he died, the last thing I know he ever said mm -hmm. was when she walked in the room. The last time, last thing I know that he ever said, she walked into the room in his last words. He never called her by her name. Never. He, she was always mama. And he, she walked into the room and his last thing he ever did is he mouthed the words mama to her. Yeah. That was a man who taught me to love my wife. That's, that's how it works. And I taught my sons how to love their wives. Mm -hmm. And Marie taught my daughters how to love their husbands. And we love each other in the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. And so she is my everything outside of Jesus. Mm. He's my everything. She's my everything outside of him. And I'm the same with her. Yes. She loves the Lord more than she loves me. And that's what I want. And every husband who wants a good Christian marriage, he needs to wash the wife with a word. He needs to give the prophetic word to her. It's not simply a Bible study, but he has to incarnate that word. He has to be the man who lives it so that the Bible is explained by a life that is lived. And if he's living for Jesus, and this woman here, I think now at this point, can probably say that she has a husband who does that. Mm -hmm. That's what earned her respect. That's what the Bible says, husbands love your wife, but wives respect your husband. Yeah. And a husband has to live in a way that this, well, that I could do this in front of you with the woman I'm holding hands with right now. Yeah. And, and I'm not being a hypocrite. Yes. You know, I can say this in front of her because it's true. What I do is true. And that's the key. Love the Lord with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who's my closest neighbor? Mm -hmm. My wife. And so if I love her as myself, what does that mean? Well, like Christ loved the church and laid his life down, then maybe I'll have a good marriage. That is cool. Yeah, that's a blessing. <laughs> yeah. I, again, uh, I didn't get Mokma on this this time, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you guys for that. That's really encouraging because, again, pulling this all back together, the importance of being centered on God's word and not centered on anything else. And uh, again, this is the fruit of, again, a church that's built on God's word and a marriage that's built on God's word. Amen. And so I want to thank our church family for tuning in. I thank Pastor David and Marie. Thank you so much. This is good times. And I hope we can continue to, to, to interview you and question and answer. We like it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And so uh, anything you want to say to our church before we leave? Yeah, God be with you. Yes. God help you. We miss you. We miss you. We're looking forward to being together again. Until that moment, stay in the word of God. Amen. That's the bottom line. Love you guys. Love you.